Yeah. Just wait a few seconds. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So the this really is a tricky problem. I didn't put tricky because uh, it was too long for the <laughs> for the screen. So it's only a problem. However, what the problem is about now? Let's see if I can manage this thing. Mm. No, this way. Okay. The origin is a paper of four authors, Burgen, Krishnapur, Kulberg, Wigman, and they studied the length of fluctuations and nodal length of random Laplace again functions on the standard two torus. So standard two torus is say complex numbers divided by <coughs> by the Gaussian the, the lattice of Gaussian integers <coughs> and uh, the Laplacian is pretty obvious how it works and the <coughs> again functions are simply the usual complex exponentials e to pi i m x times e to pi i n y and the, eigen the <coughs> eigenvalues are equal to 4 times pi squared times say m where m is a number which is a sum of two squares. So if m is representable as sum of two squares will be in more than one way in fact it can be large number of ways and these are multiple uh, these eigenvalues are not simple so you get uh, lots of eigenfunctions which are just products of two complex exponentials and you can take a linear combination is still a, an eigen <coughs> eigenfunction and you take a random combination with random coefficients according to your favorite distribution and now you <coughs> can study the nodal length, so the set, the curves, the curve where this eigenfunction is equal to zero. And uh, these are, physicists are interested in that, and there are various problems. Uh, study the, for example, the length, uh, studying the number of uh, connected components of such a curve, which is a very interesting problem. Uh, been <coughs> And uh, so the problem really depends on the study of the distribution of solutions of this equation. Each solution in integers, of course. Uh, each solution determines one eigenfunction. So uh, depending on the set of solutions, you get your set uh, basis for the eigenfunctions and then the random uh, corresponding random eigenfunctions. So for uh, the uh, distribution of the length is not, uh, does not depends on more than just the, the uh, number of solutions. And you can see this right away because what may happen, the solutions, uh, take M to be, uh, Of course, uh, consider I'm say product primes congruent to one mod four. Okay, primes go one mod four are the primes, odd primes which are sum of two squares. Now, if, if m is a square plus one, for example, then x and y, x is about say plus minus square root of, of the uh, m say k squared plus one x will be plus minus square root k, y is plus minus one, and then of course you can interchange x and y. And these solutions will be essentially at, uh, on a circle and will be at the uh, four points essentially, at the north, east, south, and west points in the circle in those directions because square root k will be is much larger than one. So uh, when you take a product of numbers like that, the arguments do, do not change much. And so you get a concentration of solutions against the four cardinal points. And so that's one kind of distribution you can get. 
But also, but however, if you take the number p at random, congruent to one mod four, the solutions are much more varied, and you get a uniform Gaussian distribution on the circle. So the to study the fine distribution, you, you have to go a little more uh, carefully, and the variance of the nodal length is a key step. Okay, let's see if I can. Um, there. So the problem reduces to the following problem. Uh, it's well known the variance is controlled to some extent by the set of three correlations. And so you consider Gaussian integers with norm m. So they correspond x plus i, y is the solution. Lambda is x plus i, y. At capital N throughout the lectures will be the number of solutions, uh, representations of m as sum of two squares. Uh, I use letter n because number theories uh, tend to use r of m, but there's just uh, four characters, and this is only one, so the formulas get a little shorter. So the three correlations, the you have to find the triples uh, equal another triple. Lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is lambda 4 plus lambda 5 plus lambda 6. And the, to find the asymptotics for the, for the length distribution of random lengths, you need to show that this number is little o of n to the fourth. Now, uh, the bound capital O n to the fourth is trivial. And little o n to the fourth turns out to be fairly tough. And what is the correct order of magnitude and distribution of solutions of this equation is, is uh, well, we conjecture now what is the correct order of magnitude. In fact, what should be even asymptotic for that. But um, we cannot prove that. However, the first proof of the estimate little n to the fourth was provided by Bourgain in that paper. And that uses uh, pretty deep uh, theorems about some product theorems about um, of discrete sets. So it's fairly abstract uh, but and does not use the structure of the um, of the numbers in a very special way. So the question was, can you, so that was enough for the application in the paper, but the problem remained. So the next thing to do is, let's see if I can change again. So this is the elementary version, x1 squared plus y squared, there are six variables, and then, uh, so, then I have this, and well, you have to count the number of solution integers of this system of equations. There are eight equations. Okay. So, if you write the solution as a Gaussian integer, well, uh, Psi 1 plus Psi 2 may cancel out, or Psi 1 may be equal to Psi 4, and so on. So if there is a cancellation in the equation for a uh, subset, you call it degenerate, and otherwise it's non-degenerate. And counting the degenerate solution is no problem. And <coughs> it's the obvious conjecture is that usually this most uh, the solutions will be trivial, so the, they will, everything cancels out, and the correct bound should be n cubed. And that is still open, by the way. Okay, so the, the lecture will describe uh, four or five different ways to attack the problem, and none of them solves the problem completely. So that's the reason the problem we think is tricky, or otherwise we are stupid, you know, one or the two. So methods, combinatorics. Just the theorem of combinatorics gives you the, what today is the 
I take the best unconditional bound below and to the fourth, of course. The Fanti approximation proves the conjecture in special cases and gives some hint what uh, the correct solution should be. Arithmetic geometry, after all, is a system of algebraic equations, polynomial equations. You can try to use arithmetic geometry and give some partial results. Then you can ask, okay, I cannot solve the problem, and then you say, well, maybe the conjecture is true, usually true. So you take a random M, almost all M's, and, and then we, the conjecture turns out to be true. So the conjecture is the N cubed? N cubed. Or 3 plus epsilon. Plus epsilon for safety should be without the safety, but uh, it's okay. Um, so, however, the interesting situation when the number of representation is very large. So it's almost as large as it can be. And again, the conjecture holds for almost all M's, except now we have to use some um, uh, high power stuff, the Birch and Smirrow die conjecture plus Riemann hypothesis for the L functions of elliptic curves over the rationals. <laughs> so the first one is known in some cases, but except, but mostly rank zero and rank one. But in our case, uh, uh, the rank will be large, so we don't know any situation of rank larger than two for which the conjecture has been proved even special numerical cases. So, um, and, well, real hypothesis, we don't know for any of those objects. There's not a single one for which has been proved. But if you assume all that, all, all the, the, the Birchian and the generalized Riemann hypothesis, you get the end cubed, is that right, or up to? You make uh, all the assumptions, almost all. Almost all. Almost all, almost all M's, right. not all of M. Let's see, is that, does it work? No. I, I don't know what happened here. Anyway, okay, um, let's move on. Otherwise, I never finish. So the full conjecture of all numbers remains open. That's sad, but, well, at least some work for somebody else to do. <laughs> so combinatorics, since in every lecture you should give proof of at least one theorem, I will describe what you do with combinatorics. So you take x the capital X or script x the set of integers pairs so that sum of two squares is m, n capital N is cardinality, trivial bound n to the fourth, as you will see in a second, and you assume these things are distinct, otherwise they are you have special solutions and you don't have to worry too much in the counting. So, oops. so the theorem is the number of interest solutions of the system is at most the power seven halves. Well, that's less than four. It's, it's a nice number. It's halfway between the conjecture three and the trivial bound four. Now, surprisingly, this theorem does not require any arithmetic. So. That's kind of surprising. So the idea is, well, take, fix the sum of the first three Gaussian numbers, called capital A plus square root minus one times B. And now the equations, you have real part, gives you the first equation, then you have the uh, imaginary part, the sum of y and y three B. And then the other equations are tells you that you have the sum of two squares equal to m. So I have five equations in six unknowns, and you can eliminate variables, and uh, you get an algebraic relation between the first coordinates and x2, say x1, x2, of the two points. Uh, for simplicity in writing up formulas, it may be convenient to write u, x1 plus x2, and t is y1 plus y2. So you can use those as new coordinates after doing the elimination. 
So elimination you do on the computer just to avoid little mistakes in counting because it's a little painful. And now we prove the theorem. So fix the, the first triple and A and B. And the first equation can be written this way because uh, capital U was X1 plus X2, right? So A is the sum X1 plus X2 plus X3, so that's X3 squared and so on. And <coughs> this is a circle in the UT plane. Radius, radius squared M and center AB. Good? Next. Consider the set of these circles, and now you get a, an incident relation between the set of points, capital uh, script P of points UT and the set of circles. And now the, say, norm of CAB is the cardinality number of points P on this circle. So the number one to count is twice the square root of B squared, the norm squared. Th that's pretty easy to see. That's the number I want. So the sum, certainly without the square, is at most and Q because given x1, x2, x3, the terms u and t and a and b. So that, that's easy. And now the number of points in a circle is at most n by definition. So n to the fourth is about the number of solutions. So now take the interval 1n and divide it into uh, relatively few dyadic intervals, d to d. And say, consider the level set where, where the number of solutions CAB uh, is inside that dyadic interval. So, <coughs> this, uh, so we have this D times that is at most N cubed. This is not difficult to see. Okay. The number I want is the sum over d, d squared c of d, because it was the, uh, the norm uh, squared, I mean, c a b squared, I want. And now use the theorem of Zimmeredi and Trotter, incidence of points and circles. And the, <coughs> the so the, no the incident number is the number, <coughs> it's, uh, for each uh, point intersection, you count either the number circle or the number of points, and then the sum. And the point is, of course, d times cd is most the incident number, and that is on the right hand side is the semi radian trotter bound. Now, that bound is sharp. There are examples in which the exponent two thirds is optimal. So, and it's not a trivial theorem to prove. Uh, the first proof used some fairly elementary but not trivial um, algebraic topology on subsets of, of the plane. So, so the incident number is what I wrote there. And now it's, and the proof is this. If C of D dominates, then <coughs> In the in the Zimmeredi Trotter bound, then D is, is bounded, and then you you, you can you get this bound and Q. If the number of points dominates, and that's most n square, then D C D n square, and otherwise, <coughs> D C D is at most n to the four D minus two. So, <coughs> and now D does not exceed n. So this bound always holds, n to n to the four d minus two. So n cubed times d was the trivial bound. In this, from this point of view, it's the sum over dyadic intervals, and so used for the short dyadic intervals, use the first term, n cubed d. For the long dyadic interval, you start gaining on d minus one. The optimal d is, of course, the square root of n cubed plus uh, times n4, so n to the 
um, uh, seven half and uh, <coughs> and uh, yeah, the sum of the intervals is exponentially convergent, so you do the total bound is n to the seven half. So that's the proof. So the there's really little used about the the equation of the circle, but uh, I mean is uh <coughs> I will not give more detail on that, and this is the only proof I will give. So let's continue. This picture are is the, the 65, which is 5 times 13, and then these are the circle radius square root 65, centered at the points P, and this is the, uh, the small circle is in red. Um, I put a circle, otherwise they're not visible, but here you get the the example, the kind of configuration <coughs> to which you apply the similarity Proctor theorem. This is the simplest case with two primes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now let's look at the Fantine approximation. Well, consider again the equation. Now use the fact that the solutions, xi, they are really uh, obtained as follows. Uh, you take uh, uh, the for uh, the number m is for if it is even I you have of course the sign plus uh, plus minus one always if it's even one plus minus i the norm is two okay and then you have Gaussian primes such that the norm is p so p is congruent to one mod four for the odd prime. Now, the group generated by the xi i belong to the multiplicity group generated by these elements. So the Q rank is at most one plus twice omega for one. Omega for one is the number of distinct prime factors congruent to one mod four. If you divide by, say, by xi six, xi i of xi six are elements of this group. So I have a s an equation like this five terms say equal to one, if, if needed you change sign of course. Uh, <coughs> and, the, and this zeta belong to a finally generated subgroup of, multiple group of, mm, it's a finally generated subgroup of C star. And now use the following theorem of Ebert, Slick, Evelein, and Schmidt uh, obtained by a deep application of, uh, of the Schmidt subspace theorem, a very, very precise form, and says that if you take any equation of this type, the coefficients are arbitrary fixed, of course, and the G1, G2, Gn are in a multiple group of rank R, then the number of solutions is bounded only in terms of n and r, and it's simply exponential in r. In fact, <coughs> uh, for c5, it, the c5 bound will be 20 to the 15. Um, the bound of for, c, for cn is doubly exponential, unfortunately, but anyway. The, the thing is, it depends only on r, so you can get a bound. Notice that this counts not only the numbers we want to count, which are simple products of the generators. This allows powers in the generators. Okay. So, the theorem is, you apply this theorem right away. There's a positive absolute constant so that the number solution is n cubed for the degenerate one. And uh, n, n, this factor n because I divided by xi6, okay, which are n possibilities. So um, I have to take that into account. And then I get constant to the power omega for 1m. So if log n divided by the number of prime factors congruent to 1 mod 4 is large, say c is 20 to the 15. 
uh, then the number of solutions and Q at the most. Well, but is this realistic? Because N is at least, <coughs> uh, it can be as small as uh, 2 to the power omega 4, 1. However, if the primes occur to a high power, N is a little bigger <coughs> than 2 to that, that thing. Each prime uh, in the decomposition of M, if the prime ap appears to the power A, the corresponding factor is A plus 1. So if A is large, say usually the average A is larger than 20 to the 15, this is verified. <laughs> so this provides uh, some small class of numbers for which the bound is correct. Uh, it's not very satisfactory, but it's a little step. So, so th this uh, theorem is not empty. Okay. Now, the true upper bound for the number of non-degenerate solution of the unit equation is expected to be, on, on probabilistic consideration, to be not exponential in, in the rank, but sub-exponential in the rank. If that were true, then the number of non-degenerate solutions will be n to the power of 1 plus epsilon, should be very small. And that is some indication. Uh, this conjecture was made uh, independently for various reasons. So there's some evidence that the correct bound for non-degenerate solution is quite small. We have no idea how to prove that. So let's go back to the system. Uh, so this I call the basic system. Now I take x1, x2, the two variables u and v I introduced uh, before, essentially. And I write k, m minus a squared minus b squared. And now you plug this in Mathematica, take a few resultants, and so on, and you get this equation. u6 is a polynomial degree 6 in u. Uh, we coefficients depend on a, b, and k. Uh, u4 is degree 4, and u2 is degree 2. The total number of coefficients uh, well over 100, but so it's better to use the computer so you don't make mistakes uh, doing it by hand. Okay. Now, the point of setting k equal m minus a square minus b square, after doing this, the parameter m in the <laughs> polynomials uh, becomes linear. So instead of fixing a and b and just considering m, you fix a, b, and k, and then it's linear in m. Okay. So that, that's, uh, so you, you consider k as an independent variable. So the plain sextic, you look at the singularities as nine double points in general. Sometimes a little more complicated, but usually, generically, have nine singularities or ordinary double points. And this means, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, is the curve of genus 1. By the way, if the genus were 2 or more, a sexty usually would have 5 times 4, 20 genus 10. So if at pure singular points, you'd say, oh, well, it's a genus 2 or more, then I say, well, let's use a conjecture of Caporazzo, Harris, and Maser, the number of solutions, or rational points, in fact, should have an absolute bound, independent of the curve. And that will solve the problem completely. Uh, elliptic curves, uh, you can have a fair amount of, num of number of in integral solutions. Maybe degenerate, but uh, anyway. So we don't know exactly how to get good bounds for the number of integer solutions on an elliptic curve. So the curve notice this so far the curve of genus 1. So it's not a particularly good model. So 
you try to plot uh, curves, and you start by computing the position of the nine double points, and here it is. This is parameters a equal one, k equal eight. There are seven lines, this line at infinity at the very top, so, and the, then the points are three singular points at infinity and six singular points here, and here is a sextic going through all these points as double points. Uh, in fact, the sextic is six lines. Hmm. That, that's kind of strange, nice. Well, can you do a little more? Well, uh, next step is, okay, uh, sex is are hard to, to study, so let's try to get a good model for the curves. Blow up the nine points, and you get, a, instead of the projective plane, you, you get a rational surface in uh, some high dimensional space. And uh, <coughs> then the uh, this curve of genus one, they become <coughs> a curve of genus one. So it's an elliptic surface, which is rational, because it's, it's the projective plane blown up at nine points. So rational elliptic surface of an uh, <coughs> uh, let's see. Okay, have uh, been studied quite a bit, and the idea will be to use this. But let's start first now with the curves of genus one. So you may assume that there is a one point which is rational, and use that point to get a structure of elliptic curve. So you have to go to the normalization, and then you take uh, the that point as origin, and, and you get the global minimal model and the minimal discriminant. In doing this, everything, the parameter m, everything is polynomial in m, so the, the height of the discriminant is logarithmic, and the height of the point of, of the integral points also logarithmic. So um, one studies really uh, points which are not too large in size. And that is the difficulty, because the points large in size you can study by uh, relatively efficiently uh, by various methods. Anyway, the uh, Spiro ratio is the ratio of the log discriminant divided by log of the conductor. Uh, the conductor is supported at the primes which divide the discriminant, but uh, the powers which appear you now be the same. Anyway, so the number of points, this is what is known by now, rational points of an elliptic curve uh, and <laughs> up to a certain level, uh, R is the rank, and you get a bound like this, a constant C1, C2, you can even get numerical bounds. This is one of the best bounds known unconditionally. Uh, the question, <coughs> so uh, the idea, the points, the uh, rational <coughs> points are more del by lattice, uh, you have a distance determined by the square root distance is the um, neuron height, and, and the constant C3 takes care of torsion points, which are bounded number by Pierrot measure. And the actual bound depends on the Spiro ratio. So if that is bounded, you can do better. If the log of the screen is large, eta log n, then you can prove a bound which is just exponential in the rank. And that will be much better for us. Okay. So out of this, you apply this type of theorem, and then you get the following conclusion. If the log of the number of representation divided by the level log of the number n goes to infinity, 
Well, the first possibility is that the number of solution of the equation is n to the power 3 plus below 1. Uh, unfortunately, the bound before is bad if the rank gets bigger and bigger, so, but in this case, uh, means that if alternative 1 does not occur, means that there are elliptic curves of unbounded rank. Now, the problem of existing the elliptic curve of unbounded rank has been around for 50 years. Oh, no, uh, 30 years. I think it was Castles who was the one who uh, mentioned that. Uh, without taking sides, for a while people started constructing curves, elliptic curves, high rank, and then bit by bit, 9, 10, 16, uh, 20, 22, 23. Uh, 27 has been reached, I believe. Uh, but things seem to have stopped. Now some people, uh, including, including myself, they think that the rank may have an absolute bound. So it may not be unbounded, maybe, maybe uh, 30 or so may be the correct bound, but who knows. So that, that's a very interesting problem in itself. So that, so, uh, you can do also, you can uh, remove, um, there was a question about the Spiro ratio. If, if number m is square free, which in a sense is the most interesting case, then you can prove for that particular, those particular curves, the Spiro ratio is bounded, in fact the bound is less than 40. And that means if m is square free, the number solution is, you can remove the condition log n over log, log m goes to infinity. So then that, a uh, little improvement, not, not much. So let's see. Uh, no, I'm going back. Why are you going back? Okay. So let's look now at the actual curves. This is one of the sextic when the parameters in m equal infinity. Oops, why, why is, oh yeah, it's supposed to go automatically. Just let me go back in a second. Uh, this is three hyperbolas. Uh, at infinity, I have those six lines. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. So, so yeah. Well yeah. So this is the those six lines I showed before, and then they become conics. I mean, this is a generic sexting with parameter m equal 50. Uh, a and k have been chosen in a certain way. So as this is two ovals, as you can see. These two ovals then they start shrinking, coming together and m equal 9.5. Next one is, what is it? There. m equal 9 is degenerate curve. It's a double curve. And it's a double cubic now. It's a sexy, but uh, it's a double cubic. For 8.8, .8, it looks like this. The six points are six base points, which are ordinary nodes. And locally, it means now here the curve is degree five. Uh, it's a, there's a degeneration essentially. Uh, Generic sect looks like that for m uh, positive, m equal two. You can see the singularities, how they change. When you go below two, 3.7, then you start getting these loops around the singularities. Um, let's see, next one. Oops, no, come on. Oh, was there. These are six lines. Generic sextic is minus a half. Oh, there's a degenerate sextic as an extra double point, which is that little dot in the center, G of zero. That's the generic one again. And then you go back at infinity, the, the three conics. Uh, yeah, three conics, yeah. So yeah, you get four uh, singular fibers. Um, wait a moment, yeah. 
four singular fibers. Oh, this one was the old one. Never mind. It's okay. And um, I had some other pictures, but uh, this is slightly earlier version. So what you have here is a family of elliptic curves is an, is an elliptic surface. So there are only four special fibers <coughs> of type I6, uh, those six lines I showed before. I3 were the three conics. I2 was the quintic with a line at infinity. And I1 <coughs> was the sextic with the extra uh, a uh, singular point which corresponds to a, to <coughs> a cubic with a, with, a, mm, with a node, with an ordinary node. Now, it turns out <coughs> that if you go to the Jacobian surface, uh, this surface has no section because it has, uh, has a double fiber. But if you go to the Jacobian surface, uh, then the double si fiber uh, becomes a simple fiber. As you have a section, and uh, this Jacobian, uh, the elliptic, rational elliptic surfaces with only four singular fibers were completely classified by uh, uh, Boville, the, uh, I mean the ones which have a section. <laughs> and there are exactly <coughs> uh, six surfaces like that. And they have no deformation. If you def try to deform the, the surface, then this, uh, the, for example, the um, fiber with six, six components splits into separate fibers with simpler singularities. And <coughs> so they are unique surfaces. And it turns out there are Shimura varieties, parameterized elliptic curves with certain specific uh, torsion groups. For this one, the Torsion group is sigma six. So, uh, by the way, Alfen was the first one in 1882 to study pencil of elliptic uh, of um, sextics through nine points, not on a on a on a cubic, and it it turns out. Um, exactly its second uh, center, uh, then it shows quite easily that there is a double fiber in the pencil, and that was uh, quite a novelty at the time. And a century later, Beauville managed to study these surfaces, and I was very surprised to find out that these uh, surfaces have been studied there in the literature. And the equation for the pencil given by Beauville is this one. So lambda now is a parameter, 1 minus a squared plus b squared over m. And uh, this is what really controls our curves. Now, our curves are in a, in a non a model which is not a Jacobian model. But if the curve is a rational point, then it's the same as one of these fibers with that particular lambda. And so uh, to study the rank suffices to study this particular uh, elliptic surface. So uh, here to do a little sweating, but you find the minimal model is written up. And so you have some information, but it's not quite enough. Anyway, um, this comes up later. But Oops. Okay. No. Nope. Why did it go back? Okay. So this is so much for the geometry, but this geometry analysis is what is needed to prove the theorem one and theorem. I mean the the next theorem, the, the theorem before. So square free number with few small prime factors, uh, I should say with some large prime factors really is more precise. The number of small prime factors may be relatively large, but still the number is dominated by the large prime factors. And so here we prove that the almost all um, 
such numbers, the number of solutions or equation is essentially n cubed. And I will explain it very <coughs> quickly how this is done. It's not entirely trivial. So, uh, and n will be square free. So you want to count the number of square free integers up to m is sum of two squares. Uh, there's an old theorem of Landau, I think 1910, which uh, counts the number uh, of integers which are sum of two squares and it's certain factor times m over square root log m. So you say, well, with a square free, then the, the density is six over pi squared. The constant should be six over pi squared times the lambda's constant. The answer is no, it's not that constant. So you have to be a little careful with this type of inferences. And this is the correct constant for this number. Okay, the theorem is, well, first you prove one theorem. Consider the number omega m and, and parameter k, which is not the k before, the new parameter, but is the, the numbers we have no prime factor smaller than k. And of course, the, I mean primes, all the primes are congruent to one mod four because I'm looking at numbers sum of two squares. So if k is fixed, you have just a sieve, the most stupid sieve you can think of, and you get uniformly in k this um, asymptotic formula. Essentially, you save a factor square root log k. Now the theorem then says that if k is large, give then delta, if k is larger than a function of delta, and m goes to infinity, <coughs> then the except for this number, a small proportion essentially, <coughs> of the <coughs> total elements omega mk, then the basic system has only trivial solutions, no non-trivial solutions. So that's pretty strong uh, result. How you prove that? Um, I'll give it. First you prove a lemma. Uh, you consider factorization of course, prime is larger than k, and you want p to the s to grow somewhat faster than exponentially s. Okay. And then, in, with that condition, it's uh, the exponential function is slowly growing, so phi of two x is or not ordered, asymptotic phi of x. So if you do that, the uh, this new, this subset, um, the exceptional set, is <coughs> relatively, relatively small. That's the key lemma. So, <laughs> you have to count uh, things. You would find out a distribution that s squared times phi s is order j up to a factor of two. And uh, I will not the important thing. And then use the fact that if you have, if you count the number of integers up to x such that the prime divided n are less than y, then there is uh, an approximation x exponential minus u log of u. u is the ratio of these two things. Th this is used a lot in uh, uh, counting numbers with special factorizations. It's, uh, Theorem, the first thing of this type, this strength was due to De Bruyne. And uh, there are, there's a lot of literature. The very refined estimates, uh, in fact, are even equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis uh, for when, when the parameter u is um, um, very, <coughs> uh, rather, uh, rather large. You have to be a little careful. Anyway, if you do the counting, I will just show what, what comes out. It's, as you see, it's not that complicated. There are cases and so on, the, the ranges for u, ranges for y. I mean, it's uh, put things together and you prove dilemma. Okay. So for the theorem, you want to count the solutions. 
And now you do the following. Can you consider your equation, and the solution is trivial if terms cancel out in pairs. Okay, then you have the set M sub R is the, now these are indeterminates, but you, in your mind, you think of the indeterminates as representing the Gaussian primes, pi one, pi r, and their conjugates. Okay, and now you do the following. You first ask when it is that the sum of such polynomials is zero as polynomials. So you just count them, and then you you pick up, you pick out the omega r, omega bar, the two indeterminants, and and uh, you then choose and keep repeating, and uh, and this thing you can continue to do that unless you reach a stage in which the g and h are both zero. So okay. So what you get in this way is essentially a tree in which the branching corresponds to splitting this into two pieces, but maybe if one is zero, then okay, then it goes straight and with only without the extra branching. And when it both are zero, you stop. So, so the sequence, uh, such a sequence, uh, give a sequence of nodes of a tree, starts with a root of r, and then produce one or two branches, and in this way. And now you <laughs> essentially have a, a way of cutting the, chopping the tree. Because, <coughs> all right, the chopping the tree is here depends on the fact uh, if you have a one branch, only one branch, not two, then you have a relation of this type here. So this is determined by what the, pi the prime preceding and, and the branch. But now suppose you have that, and then this thing is proportional, and, <coughs> and then this ratio determines the next prime. So th this gives you a way of chopping the tree, and that's the counting, and and so after all this sweating, you you have the lemma. Oops. Mm -hmm. So conclusion. The w from the lemma, it's not too difficult to deduce this theorem. When m for almost numbers m. The basic number system, the basic system, has bound eight to the number of prime factors of n to that power, prime factors congruent to one mod four, and that is the number of trivial solutions. The non-degenerate solution, the degenerate non-trivial, is four to the n, so n squared, and the non-degenerate solution at most order n, for almost all n. M's. So that, that's of some interest. So in the next five minutes, I will conclude with the square free numbers with very many small prime factors and let's say almost all of the same size. So you consider square free numbers, or two squares. <coughs> And the number of prime factors will be, say, a is some large constant times log m over a double log of m. And so the size of the factors is about log m to the power a. Um, and uh, the theorem is that when there's a function epsilon a, when a goes to infinity, almost <coughs> elements in n3 plus epsilon a. In fact, the theorem is more precise because this was an earlier version not as precise. That if a is larger than some absolute constant, which may be 8 or 10, something like that, or maybe even 2, it cannot be smaller than 2. 
uh, anyway, if A is larger than some absolute constant, the number of solutions all n q plus epsilon. So that, that's the actual theorem. Uh, this was an early version in which I, I used the, the wrong file for, for these slides. So how do you obtain that? Again, you want to control the rank of the elliptic curve on average. Okay. So the idea is to apply the Weyl explicit formula to control the order of zero of the L function of the elliptic curve at s equal to one. And the fact that the same is that order of zero is the rank, that is the Birchin Swinger diet conjecture. Um, I don't know any theorem which proves that conjecture on average, so uh, let's assume the full conjecture. Then. So the idea to apply the Weyl's explicit formula goes back to Mestre and Goldfeld um, for the first time to apply it for a family of curves. Uh, Brewer uh, uh, refined quite a bit Goldfeld's idea and Hit Brown had an additional idea of using moments of the rank, high moments, uh, a certain order to obtain better average, uh, better bounds for the average. So all these ideas come in the next step. So the extension, the problem is <laughs> the family is considered by um, um, Goldfield, Broomer, and Hit Brown, and more recently by Miller and uh, Wong, I think, the collaborator. Okay, uh, I didn't know that, but it's okay. Um, is um, uh, the families considered are nice families, so which are which are parameterized by the points on some geometric. Uh, for example, you take the elliptic curves in standard form: y squared plus x cubed plus a x plus b, and they vary a and b in a certain ranges and obtain results. But in our case, the numbers A and B, if you remember, they're given the equations, the minimal associated minimal equation are rather tricky and depends uh, polynomially on the parameter lambda. And the parameter lambda was one minus A squared plus B squared divided by M. M is only some square free number. And it's a relatively small set because the M's are restricted to have prime factors in all the same size and certain ranges. So uh, this brings uh, quite a few com complications and requires about 25 pages of this paper to, <coughs> to deal with that. So <coughs> I will not uh, save that for the <laughs> next lecture. <laughs> so I only say what is the L function. Uh, this is self-explaining, <coughs> it's a Dirichlet series. The AP are essentially the, the trace of the Frobenius. Uh, <coughs> so it can be expressed in terms of the Jean symbol in our case. Um, for the, the short Weierstrass minimal <coughs> model, which means oh, over the rationals, things are a lot easier. Uh, but um, the short minimal model is x cubed x, uh, ax cubed plus ax plus b. Uh, and you can have a global one like that except for the prime two and three. Okay, then, so this is your L function. And here is the formula, I hope it's correct, yeah. <coughs> is uh, phi is uh, Fourier transform fx even continues rapidly decreasing so everything is convergent nicely and uh, <coughs> and then you have this and so you want now the f to be with compact support so the sum on the right hand side is a finite sum 
the correction of the integral becomes not, not important in this case. This is the, um, the log of, um, of um, um, what do I want to say? Uh, uh, the, the log of the conductor, f of zero. This is pi to the zeros. Now for rho equal one, you get the rank times phi evaluated at one. So if you, <laughs> on the, if you choose f such that phi is positive on the line, uh, on the critical line, then you have here is sum of positive terms, so the rank times phi of one is majorized by this quantity. And then you try to optimize f to, to balance things and get it bound as good as you can. Well, uh, for a single elliptic curve, this does not give you very much. So you take everything to a high power, and then you make the average over the, the elliptic curves, in our case, over the parameter lambda. Uh, you put a probability distribution now on the primes in the dyadic interval, which occur in your numbers. And there is an induced probability distribution on the lambdas. But the lambdas are not so simple because our a squared plus b squared divided by n. So it's a complicated thing. And, but it's a natural distribution on those curves. And then you have to make the average with respect to that distribution. Uh, and there are new problems which come in. However, the things eventually come to the, to the <coughs> That, that's pretty hard, but the result is this, and this is the end. Thank you.